Hi everyone, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg, and I'm your host of Yoga Birth Babies. Now, you may have heard of labor support doulas, the people that help you during your birth. But then you might be thinking, what happens after? Is there somebody that can support you when baby comes home? And there is. It's called a postpartum doula. So today's conversation is all about postpartum doulas. Now to have this conversation, I have Valerie Trumbauer. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a donor certified postpartum doula, a a certified lactation counselor and mother of three, including identical twins. And she has an online course and resources, including Expecting 101 and Expecting 101. You're adopting, which has helped thousands of parents to be prepared for life with a newborn. Now, Valerie mainly does overnight. So you're going to hear all about what to expect from an overnight postpartum doula, but we're going to get down down to the basics. What is a postpartum doula and what do they do? How can a postpartum doula help you transition into parenthood and caring for your newborn. They're very practical. I had a postpartum doula with both my kids and it was so helpful to have somebody show me some of the basics like how do you bathe your baby? How do you swaddle them? Umbilical cord care, circumcision care, just so much information that they have available. So I think you're going to get a lot out of this conversation. Now, before we take a deep dive into the conversation with Valerie, let me give you a heads up of what's happening at PY. So we are adding to our online on demand, sorry, our on demand library with two new courses. So check those out. We have a newborn care and a childbirth preparation course. So we have a very robust on demand library. We've also are continuing our online classes every day. Now I know that our schedule doesn't always work with your schedule. So we have re-releases. These have been huge and really popular. So after every morning class, we re-release that class twice throughout the day so that you can have a brand new class to take each day. So check that out if you need to take class on your time. And then the last thing I want to talk about is a change that we made in our teacher training schedule. So our plan was to have two in person and two online teacher trainings each year. But I was starting to get a lot of emails from people saying, I really want to take your September, October training, but I can't get to New York for two separate weekends. Because let's face it, New York City is expensive. So because so many people were reaching out, we made the decision, okay, let's bring it online if that's what people want. So that is now open. We're already registering people. So if you can do our training online, it's going to be in September and October. And then we have a late October into end of November, beginning of December online. And then we have another online January, February, and then we'll be back in person in March and April. We just finished our in-person training this year. It was so much fun. I just love teaching teacher training. It's finding a new group of people that's excited to take this material to their communities is so exciting to me. And of course, every year in May, I have our online postnatal teacher training. So if that interests you, mark that in your calendar because it's just once a year. And of course, I also have some on-demand courses for this, but all right, that is enough of me. Now, the last thing I want to say is a big thank you. Our community has just grown and grown and grown, and I never want to take that for granted. I always want to say I appreciate you being part of the PYC community. I appreciate you showing up for our classes, and I appreciate you listening to the podcast. So a big thank you. All right, let's take a quick break. When we get back, get ready to learn all about postpartum doulas with Valerie Trumbauer. Hi, Valerie. How are you? Hi, Deb. Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing well. Absolutely. I'm really excited to talk about this. I think 
preparing for postpartum and the work of postpartum doulas are it's so important. And I don't think it's something that a lot of us put thought into when pregnant. So I think this is going to be a really important and great conversation. So I guess we should just jump right in. Um, yes, let's love- do it. Yeah. So why don't we start with you telling me a little bit about yourself and what led you to becoming a postpartum doula? Sure. Okay. So my name is Valerie Trumbauer. I'm a postpartum doula as well as a lactation counselor. I'm also a native New Yorker, although I now live in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, about two hours from New York. But um, I have worked here as a postpartum doula and a lactation counselor for the last 10 years. So some people don't you know, they hear the word doula and immediately start telling me about like their labor and thinking that I work in, um, you know, in the labor and delivery room. And that is not the case. That's a birth doula just to kind of start with that. Cause I think it can be confusing. And a lot of people don't even know that there are two types of doulas. So mm-hmm. as a postpartum doula, I am working in people's homes, usually starting very often the first or second night after you, they bring their babies home. And so it really is, um, it's such a unique experience to work all like inside someone's home during one of the most pivotal times, you know, in your life, as you are getting acclimated as a new family. So I, um, I went down that doula road, um, after having, I have my, I had my daughter and then three years later I had identical twins. And at the time that my kids were born, I didn't even know what a postpartum doula was. And Mm -hmm. so it was after, um, after I had twins and well, when I was pregnant with twins, I would say that I was planning to breastfeed. And so many people's reaction was, can you even do that? Or like, is that even possible? And so I kind of came to the other side of this thinking like, I want to help people understand that breastfeeding twins is possible and, you know, what that looks like. And so I started out as a volunteer breastfeeding counselor with a local hospital. And then from there, found out what a postpartum doula was and started training for that. And so that's kind of how I ended up where I am. That is so great. I love when it's an organic road to where you want to be. So that's so great. So like you said, a lot of people hear doula, they think birth doula. So let's start with the basics. Yes. What does a postpartum doula do? So clearly they're on the postpartum side, but what are all the goodies that they do? Yeah, A postpartum doula, I mean, really, it can look very different depending on the family that I'm working with. So the way that I explain it is whatever helps you to, you know, be the most comfortable as you're acclimating to life with your newborn. And for some people, well, as a doula, I only work overnight. So I generally work 10 PM to 6 AM. So that's just what has always worked well for my family, but there are postpartum doulas who work during the day. Mm -hmm. Um, during the day you're working alongside, um, you know, with mom or dad and kind of guiding them and like, Oh, let me show you the baby. You know, the baby is crying and this looks like what the baby needs, or this looks like just kind of helping them here. Let's give the baby a bath. This is how you would do that. That's what's happening during the day is really modeling, you know, walking alongside someone as they are getting comfortable in their new role. Now, as a postpartum doula working overnights, a lot of the time mom or dad is asleep. Um, you know, sometimes, and we can talk about it, um, after this, if that's helpful, but if a mom's nursing, then it can look a little bit different. If a mom is formula feeding, very often they're asleep for probably seven hours of an eight hour shift. (laughs) Yeah. So, which is total dream, but even if they're breastfeeding, um, and maybe we want to talk about that, but, um, as a postpartum doula, I'm usually getting to people's house at like nine 45 or 10 at night and then working until 6 AM. And so during that time, everything from, you know, burp, you know, burping the baby, soothing after a feeding, getting the baby back to sleep, light meal prep. So if you want to have like overnight oats in the crock pot, or you want to have dinner in the crock pot and ready to go in the morning, or sometimes it's like, you know, that time of postpartum, it can be challenging for some people. And it can just be, I'll, I'll sit down and say to a mom, 
okay, what feels heavy right now? And then Mm -hmm. just really listen. And sometimes it's, I feel like I don't even have time to eat. And it's like, okay, well, let's think about like, what would taste good to you right now? If you were sitting down, would a hard boiled egg be something that's easy for you to grab? Would veggies? And so then it's like, Hey, tonight I'm going to hard boil eggs, or I'm going to make these little protein balls or something like that. I'm going to cut the pineapple that's, you know, rotting on your countertop (laughs) and makes you feel awful when you look at it. Um, and as well as like baby laundry and baby clothing organization and all of that kind of thing. So it's all happening while people sleep and then you wake up and whatever makes you kind of come down in the morning and be like, yes, I've got this, you know, like, You're like life a little of a newborn fairy. Tart. <laughs> yeah. My, I, my husband jokes with me. He's like, we need a postpartum doula. And you like do all this, all these things in the middle of the night. And then I come home and I'm like, I go to sleep at, you know, 9 PM on the nights I don't work. So it's, it's funny. I'm like, no, I don't do laundry in the middle of the night here, <laughs> so, but it is. <laughs> when are most people hiring a postpartum doula because I remember with my first, so we chose a home birth and I remember the, everyone left, the midwife left, the, the doula left. And we had like a three hour window between when the postpartum doula got there and we were on our own with this brand new baby. And we just had to count down the minutes, like keep the baby mm-hmm. alive until she yeah. gets here. So we chose like right away, what are you typically seeing with your clients? you know what, it can, it can look very different. Like some people know, you know, a lot of times if it's a repeat, if it's a family I've worked with in the past, as soon as they know they're pregnant, they're like, I'm doing October. Can you mark me down for October? Um, or I I guess if you have, if it's your first baby and you're not sure, like a lot of times people will start at about 18 weeks, really looking for a doula. But then the other side of this is sometimes people either don't know what a postpartum doula is or don't think that it's a need that they're going to have. And Mm -hmm. then the baby is born and now they're in a case, in a situation. And it might be like the birth looked different than you thought. Your recovery looks different than you thought it would. There's There's quite a few different reasons that could happen that after the baby's born, you're like, you know what? I do need this help that I didn't think that I was going to need. And then they'll look at that time. The closer you get to the date, it's kind of like you know, it's, it can be hard to find someone. I was just thinking about that because if you want someone like you finally are thinking this was a mistake, not getting somebody, I need someone tomorrow. You, it may be hard to find someone with that kind of availability. For sure. Yeah. And and it is, it's funny because at the same point, like, you know, I've, I can't even count the number of times that I've stood at like a party or a barbecue and explained what I do. And people are like, that's a thing. I'm like, yes, not only is it a thing, it's like a very busy, like I'm booked, you know, it, most doulas are booked months and months in advance. But with that being said, there's often ways that like, if I got a call and it's a lot of times it's multiples where people are like, okay, we thought this was going to look different or, you know, mom's recovery is different. And it's like, okay, you're looking for three nights a week. I only have one night a week, but I have another doula friend who she can do, you know, and sometimes we can kind of help piece it together because it is, it's, you want to give people that support when they're looking for it. So sometimes we can piece it together, but it's not ideal. So if it's something that you think you might want, then you want to explore it early on. And there's no harm in speaking with a doula, meeting with a doula and understanding like, what does doula care look like? And really understanding if that's something that your family would benefit from. Oh, that's a great explanation. So let's talk a little bit about that transition into parenthood. So from your experience, what are some of the things about the transition into parenthood that expectant parents should start to think about well before the birth? You know, I think that it's something where people feel almost like embarrassed to say, they don't know how to do something. Like if it was like, like people feel like they're just supposed to know how to care for a newborn. Like we all should just know how to do this. And I don't think that's the case. Like I always say to people, you know, like you're an attorney, you're a teacher. Like I couldn't walk in the door and do your job tomorrow morning with absolutely you know, no training at all. And I think seeing it as you're headed into a new role and this role can look a lot of different ways and your transition as a new family will go most smoothly when you understand what to expect and how to handle different situations. Because Mm -hmm. what is so difficult is that you and your partner are navigating 
this new life with this new little person that you're so excited to meet, but there's so many balls in the air. Like you're surviving on less sleep than you're used to. You're getting to know this little person, you know, who communicates through crying. You, your relationship is changing. So I think understanding that preparation beforehand is so important because sometimes I'll, I'll talk to people and they're like, Oh, we're just gonna, you know, kind of wing it. And we're laid back people. And it's like, okay, that's great. And that will serve you well in parenthood. Like it's a whole journey, but, um, understanding it's not, it's not well rested you who's going to be navigating this time. So winging it can, it, it's going to be more challenging than it needs to. So that preparation ahead of time, just understanding what to expect as far as caring for a baby and understanding what a newborn needs and how they communicate. That makes a lot of sense. All right. So I'm going to follow up on this with what are some things that you typically see as a postpartum doula that takes new parents by surprise when it comes to life with a newborn? And I'm going to just interject one thing that took me by surprise, even though I knew this mentally, it was how often they fed. Like I I Mm -hmm. knew it. Like I had it in my head. I took a lactation class, but when it actually came down to it, I kept thinking like, didn't I just do this? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That so sticks with me all these years. What are some things that you are noticing? Oh, for sure. And your day becomes this blur where you're like, wait, how many times did I wake up last night? I don't even know. And you really genuinely don't. I think what I see is that you know, people don't understand what typical newborn behavior looks like. So if you don't understand that and, you know, it can, it's very easy to be anxious of like, oh my gosh, this baby is crying and something must be wrong. Or, you know, just not understanding the way that the baby communicates is through crying. And when you don't understand what typical newborn behavior looks like, it's, it, it's so challenging when you don't understand, you know, you mentioned feeding when, if you're, planning to breastfeed and you don't know, you know, you haven't taken a breastfeeding class, it can be really challenging in those early weeks where you're figuring it all out. So I think that people just don't, um, they don't often see that, like that need to understand ahead of time what to expect and just the tremendous difference that it makes when you, because if you're in it and you know, you're sleep deprived and you're like, Oh, he's doing that thing that they said might happen. I get it. You know, or you're breastfeeding and you go to latch the baby and you know, your thumb is on this like little lump and you're like, Oh, okay. I know what that is. Not like going down the spiral of like, Oh my gosh, there's a lump in my breast and I have a newborn. And (laughs) you know, it's like, yeah. you, you want to know what to expect. And there's such a value in that. Yeah, no, that makes absolute sense. Gosh, I remember breastfeeding thinking that I've got this, I've, we got this. And then I think we were like three weeks in and the baby just would not latch one night. And I'm like, we do not have this. We mm-hmm. need help. We need help right mm-hmm. now. But well, I it's love, funny. It's yeah. funny. You mentioned three weeks because when, and I should have, you know, as you're, if you're looking to hire a doula, it's like, you want to be really open about what your budget is because, and I have this conversation with people because it's like, I will not let you run out of money before three weeks. Three weeks is overall like a pretty challenging time because all the people who were bringing you food and texting to be like, how's the baby? They're all like, ah, haven't you had the baby for a while now? Everything's fine. But you know, meanwhile, the baby's going through all of these different changes and feeding can sometimes be challenging at that time. So that three week mark can be a tough one. I love that you focus on like making sure that the parents that you work with get the support they need before their budget runs out. I actually, my studio folks, cause I own the prenatal yoga center are the teachers for for my first child for my um, baby shower gift is they got me, I think it was like 12 hours of postpartum doula for work for my baby shower gift. And it was the Mm -hmm. best. And I've actually mentioned that to other people. And I'm like, this is the best gift. Can I get that for you? Uh, Yeah, it is. And it's so funny because I have a group of girlfriends, like they're not my girlfriend. It's like this group of girlfriends. And every time one of them has a baby, they give an overnight of my support or like a few hours of my support. And, um, and it's such, especially for people who it's not their first baby. It's like, okay, you're having your third baby in five years. What do you 
possibly need. You need sleep. help. It's sleep. You know? And what's so funny is the one time it, they had given four hours of my support. So it was like one of these times that I did work during the day, which is very rare. But um, I had emailed with it or I had texted with this mom to figure out, okay, this is when I'm going to come. And as soon as I knocked on the door, she like looked stunned. Like she came to the door and she was like, oh my gosh, um, we had the wrong day. Like I thought you meant next Wednesday. And now I see that it was this Wednesday. I didn't, she, first thing she said, she's like, I didn't even clean my house. I'm like, okay, first of all, never <laughs> clean your house because a doula is coming. Um, and she's like, my mother-in-law's here. I was like, you know what? We're, it's totally fine. Like you know, her baby was like 10 days old. I'm like, this is great. We'll make it work. So I came into that situation and we talked to the, I talked to mom and I was like, okay, why don't you go upstairs, take a shower. So now it's me and the mother-in-law and the mother-in-law you can see is like, skeptical of she's like what do you do <laughs> what are you doing and so during the next the over the course of the next four hours it's like I gave the baby a bath I loaded the dishwasher I started dinner I ran a load of baby laundry by the end of uh, of that four hours the mom was like I'm from Buffalo do they have these in Buffalo can I get one of these for my friend's daughter <laughs> like she was totally sold on what uh, postpartum doula was it was so funny because I saw like she was just like what is this <laughs> by the end, she was like, this is the greatest thing ever. I want to give this to everyone. It is. It really is an amazing gift. So friends out there, if you're listening, you're pregnant and you're listening to all this and you're thinking, I need this. Yes, you do. <laughs> you do. Mm-hmm. Tell your friends, not yes. another onesie. You don't need another onesie. You need a Right. No, doula. exactly. Exactly. Sure. And sometimes people will say, how long do you work with a family? And it's like, well, in cases like that, it's just one or two times of going to their home if it, if it was a gift or something like that. And so, you know, you can pool together, get a group of friends together and give uh, postpartum doula support to, to somebody. How long do you typically work? So say it's not a gift. How, what's your typical stay with a family? One it's week, two generally- weeks, three weeks? Well, it's generally, honestly, based on what works budget wise for a okay. family. Um, if there, if monetarily there is, you know, that's not an issue, then I would say it's usually 12 weeks. Wow. Um, Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's a much longer time than I thought. Wow. But it, it, during that time, it will usually just be two to three nights a week. So it might okay. be if somebody like if, if we were talking and you were like, I'm pregnant with my first baby, what what kind of support? If money's not an issue, my um, general recommendation is three nights a week for the first like two or three weeks and then to go to two nights a week. I have also, with that being said, I don't do it anymore, but I used to work. There's families where I've worked with them five nights a week for eight weeks. I don't wow. do that anymore because it's hard to be personable to your own family when you work overnights that much. But, um, you know, sometimes, but I think a good middle ground is those first couple of weeks, three nights a week can be helpful because you're in the midst of those hard nights. You're like, okay, but Valerie's here tomorrow night. I can do this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I'll get there and they're like, okay, this is what happened last night. Or he's doing this. Does that seem normal? You usually have questions that you want to run by someone. Mm -hmm. Um, and then by the time the baby's 10 or 12 weeks, if somebody's still looking for support, it's mostly because they don't want to be waking up at night. And so then I kind of try to transition out of a lot of postpartum duels will stay on there, but I feel like I really have the power to make the biggest difference in those early weeks. So a lot of times I'll kind of, uh, you know, turn it over to somebody else who it's like, okay, now they just want three nights a week until the baby sleeps through the night or something like that. But I would say I generally stay with a family about 10 to 12 weeks. So, all right, 10 to 12 weeks. I can imagine someone saying, if you were listening, hearing that they want longer than 12 weeks, where are we then seeing the line between maybe a nighttime nanny or a baby nurse? Because I think by 12 weeks, we're out of that technically like fourth trimester, yes. if, I'm, if I'm thinking correctly. Yes, that is exactly the case. And so that is where, I mean, it depends where you live and like where I live in Bucks County, um, this area, it's not, there's not a lot of night nurses. And so I couldn't say like, oh, like I don't usually turn it over to a night nurse. I generally turn it over to like a doula who's just getting her business started. And so she will probably not charge as much to be completely honest. And so it's Mm -hmm. like here, now you just want somebody to, you know, feed your baby and so that you can sleep a longer stretch. So here, but in a place like New York, where it's like, it might be a newborn care specialist. It might be a night nurse where you're not looking for that, um, that lactation support. And that's a really common question is like, what's the difference between a night nurse and a postpartum doula? And it's like, as a postpartum doula, I am supporting the whole family. I'm supporting you as a new mom and 
that breastfeeding experience and what's feeling heavy. And as you navigate and process what the birth looked like and did it look different than what you thought it would be. And that can be really traumatic and just everything as you get acclimated where a night nurse is come in, take care of the baby, leave. And Mm -hmm. so, as you said, like after you're all acclimated and now you're like, I just want my sleep. That's when a newborn care specialist or a night nurse or something like that might might work better. I don't think you're going to be getting too many night nurses that are prepping your meal for the next day, which sounds absolutely delightful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We're going to take a break, but when we come back, you mentioned the mother-in-law. So I want to go into the idea of the difference between what a postpartum doula offers as opposed to getting family support. Okay. We're going to be right back. Spin your passion into a business with Shopify and break sales records with the world's best converting checkout. Let's hear that one more time. The world's best converting checkout. Shopify's legendary checkout makes it easier for customers to shop on your website, across social media, and everywhere in between. Now that's music to your ears. Any way you spin it, you can be a smash hit with Shopify. Start your dollar a month trial today at shopify.com slash records. Okay. So we're back. So this was interesting. Cause I remember again, I often refer back to either my experiences or that of my friends or my students. And I hear from students and I remember my own experience about having family support as opposed to a postpartum doula, because they don't have that emotional tie. But I also remember my mother-in-law who still does this, who's a lovely person, but often talks about, you know, when she was raising her kids or my niece and nephew who are, you know, I think 12 years older than my kids. So can you talk a little about the emotional support of working with a postpartum doula and how that differs from getting family support? Sure. Yeah. And when someone is pregnant and they're kind of planning for what their support is going to look like postpartum, I talk a lot about what, what do you want it to look like? And, you know, maybe you have family that has said like, oh, I'll help you. And I'm willing to help after you have the baby talk, really thinking about optimally, what do you want that help to look like? If it's going to be from a family member, then saying, this is what I'm looking for. Is that what you're imagining? Okay. If not, you know, that might not be the case, or it might be a case where you're like, I don't want, I, like, I love my mother-in-law or I love my mother, but I don't want her to be here in that capacity. I want to free her up to just be grandma. And yeah. then that way you are not navigating this relationship and you have this past relationship with your family, you're not navigating through that, which can be a little bit sticky as you're also getting comfortable in this new role. So, um, I think that you're also not second guessing. Like if I say something, it's, you know, if I'm saying, oh, hey, my recommendation would be this, you're more likely to be like, oh, okay, Valerie said yep. we should do this. You're not going, well, I don't know. Should I Google that? Like it's like, it's a different relationship. Um, and uh, family relationships can be challenging. And so I think you have to decide, you know, best your family and Mm -hmm. what you want your postpartum time to look like, but being real about, and being honest, like, thank you so much mother-in-law for offering, but actually I think we're going to do this, but you know, we would love to have you you know, stop over in the afternoon or whatever. I have a lot of um, information online where I'll talk directly to grandparents to be, because I think sometimes there's a lot of confusion around what like quote unquote helping looks like. Helping (laughs) is not you go to their house and sit on the couch and hold the baby while they're running around and loading the dishwasher and throwing a load of laundry in. It's like, if you're helping a new mom, you're, she's sitting on the couch ideally, and you're (laughs) throwing the laundry in, you know? So it it can, it can be a little bit challenging, but when it comes from me, when very, sometimes I am there at the same time as, um, as the in-laws. And I, it's a situation where I can say, you know, look, like, look, this is a way that you can support this family during this time. Or I will be there after mom or the mother-in-law has been there through the day. And by the time I get there, you know, mom's pulling her hair out because she's like, oh, my mom was here today and I lost my patience with her and I feel bad. And so it kind of gives me this insider track to be able to talk to grandparents and be like, here's how you can help. And here's what might seem like it's helpful, but it's actually not. 
<laughs> and you also have more accurate, up-to-date information than most family members, unless they're accurately looking at what's happening in the guidelines of like how babies sleep, swaddling, feeding. You know, I can't imagine that what my mom did with myself and my brother would apply to babies today. I mean, back when I grew up in the seventies and eighties, I don't think we even wore (laughs) seatbelts. You know, like, so things are different. Oh, me too. And that's what I say, you know, like your, your mom or your mother-in-law might be well-meaning in the advice that they're giving, but it's been 30 years since they had a baby and there's been advancements. The, The guidelines are constantly changing. This is what I do for a living. And sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, they just changed that. Or they just changed this, let alone what we were doing 30 years ago. So you want, you want to make sure that, you know, that's why if you're, you know, if your mother-in-law is where you're getting the majority of your information and not to at all put down family that's helping, but it can be really confusing. I just worked not that long ago. I worked with a family where, um, the mom was in from Taiwan actually for six months. She was staying with the new parents. And so there was definitely a language barrier and she would come down, like I'm working at night and she would come down and she just wanted to learn like, oh, what was I doing when the baby had gas? Or um, one night it was like, oh, you know, my mom wants to watch you give the baby a bath to understand how to do this. And she just kept saying, like, it was like, we had very little communication, but she was like, what you do is so different. That's so different. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Like, you know, cause there it was culturally and she hadn't had a baby in 35 years. So right. it's like, it, it does look different. And I can understand you know, as grandma, you're like, wait a second. I don't know about that, but that's where you want to have, you want to really have a clear understanding of the place I'm getting my information from. I, I know it to be true. And so I'm not second guessing myself when you have Mm -hmm. a grandmother who's like, no, if you put rice in his bottle, he's going to sleep longer. Like, "Mm, no, we stopped doing that a long time ago. I mean, unless there's like unless a GI doctor is telling you to do that, you're not doing that. You know, there's certain things where it's like, no, we're not doing that anymore. Sorry. (laughs) No, that makes sense. And I think, again, it's, I think those friends, family are incredibly well-meaning, but they, yeah, they're coming from their own lens of maybe how they had a baby or, uh, you know, antiquated ideas. So I, that's why yeah, another and, reason and, I love postpartum doulas. Yeah. Or they're coming from the side of like, well, that's what I did with you and you're fine, which yeah. is like a thorn in my side. It's like, okay, that's fine. You might have put every baby you ever had to sleep on their stomach, but the facts don't lie here. Like we, the back to sleep movement and all of that made a significant difference in things like sudden infant death syndrome, you know? So right. it's like, you can look at things and say, well, this is what we did with you. And like, okay, but God forbid something were to happen. Like we know better. So we're doing that. Right. Right. Okay. I want to get back to some ideas of adjusting to parenthood because it is a huge adjustment. So when you go to work with a new family, is there anything you find universally helps them adjust to parenthood besides sleep? I think that's the best one. Sleep, sleep, yeah. sleep, 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 sleep is, is helpful. I think when, or I know what I've seen over the years is when both parents feel comfortable caring for a newborn Mm. and, you know, likely someone's going to be more comfortable. Okay. That's fine. But when someone is just uncomfortable, you know, let's say I'm going to say, you know, okay, it's mom and dad and dad's uncomfortable. That's not always the case, but if that's the case, whoever's uncomfortable, all of the work and all of the baby care is falling to that other person, which is stressful for that parent who does feel comfortable. And then this parent who doesn't has looked forward to the baby's arrival for so long. And now they feel out of touch. They feel like they're not bonding with the baby. They feel like they don't know how to help. So it's a helpless feeling for that parent, the other parents feeling overwhelmed. So there is so much value in both of you understanding you know, how to change a diaper, how to soothe the baby. What does newborn sleep look like? What does, you know, what am I going to do when the baby does this? Because that's the difference between like, oh, okay, you sleep for an extra hour. I'll take the baby downstairs. Or why don't you head up to bed now? I'll bring him up in an hour to eat. That, those little things, you know, it might just be an hour here, an hour there. That makes a huge difference for both parents. 
Yeah. No, my husband was the best swaddler. I don't know how he did it, but he could like wrangle a hyena. He was so Mm -hmm. good at it. And I really appreciated it because, you know, when I was tired and struggling, he absolutely could do a much better job. And he could, when my son got to be a toddler, even if he was like running around the room, there was a diaper on that butt. Like he was able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's great when both parents, if if there are two parents, um, can jump in and, and take hold. And I think very often if, you know, if there are two parents and mom's planning to breastfeed or someone's planning to breastfeed, then it can be easy to say like, well, I'm going to be feeding the baby. So it's all going to fall to me. No, there is, there are plenty of things that your partner could be doing. And so I'll spend time talking about like, okay, when the baby starts to, you know, you hear the baby rustling around, okay, that partner is going to get up and change the baby while you go to the bathroom and get yourself set up to to feed the baby or now the baby has been fed and he has the hiccups. Okay. You're handing off to your partner. So it's not a case of like someone's breastfeeding. So everything must fall to that person. Right. And and I think conversation ahead of time. So expectations can be set. So they're not negotiating when everyone's tired and the birthing parents hormones have dropped. I think, you know, we talked about preparation for the transition. I think this should definitely be part of that conversation. For sure. You're having that conversation before the baby arrives and then also having the conversation where you can keep revisiting it. Like, oh my God, this is how I'm feeling right now. And this feels so heavy to me. And that doesn't mean like the other parent is doing something wrong. It's just like, this is how there's so much change all throughout the first few weeks after the baby's arrival that it's like, you need that open dialogue to be able to say like, right now, I feel like I'm struggling with this. And that allows the other partner to be able to, you know, kind of come in and help where they can. Mm -hmm. All right. So when I was telling my prenatal students about this conversation, I asked, because I always do, I kind of pull them up. What do you want to hear? The biggest concern, we've talked about this a little bit, but the biggest concern was sleep as you know, Mm -hmm. we've talked about. So can you talk a little bit about, I guess, expectations of the reality of how much sleep, assuming that someone doesn't have a postpartum overnight doula, like what is the typical newborn sleep cycle? Yes. I was just talking to someone about this the other day because this is like, I mean, of course, for people who are hiring an overnight doula, sleep is like the number one thing, but just new parents in general, that is the biggest concern. And it makes sense. And I was saying to them, like newborns sleep 17 hours a day. So it's, you know, like that's a lot of sleep. And so what's all this talk about, you know, um, (laughs) tired new parents, it's because it happens in one to two hour increments. So when we look at that 17 hours of sleep in 24, but only in one to two hour increments, it's so cut up. Right. But as we prepare to navigate this time, it's like, understand what to expect. So the baby is going to wake frequently at the minimum, I would say every two to three hours, because that's when they're eating in the first few few weeks. And so if not more often, like every one to two hours. So you want to understand what it's going to look like. Now we talked about if you're, you know, expanding your family with a partner, you want to be really open about, okay, what's this going to look like? How are we going to navigate this? When am I going to hand off to you? Um, and then just understanding where you can get sleep. Like sleep isn't just going to be something that happens between 10 PM and 6 AM right now. If you don't have overnight care, it's like, you got to find your little pieces of sleep throughout the day. Not like sleep when the baby sleeps. That is easier said than done. But you know, you might be like, oh, actually I take a little cat nap from five to seven thirty every night or something. Cause you you want to be able to still get that sleep, but it's mm-hmm. not gonna, it's not gonna be long stretches at night. Um, but I was just recently I was um putting together a new workshop and I was like um looking at all of the statistics about sleep deprivation. And until 2009, the US government used sleep deprivation as a form of interrogation, and it was like listing why. And it was like, you know, it, it plays with your brain so much. Like you're delusional, you're, you know, the symptoms of ADHD, all of these things, because when you go without sleep, it's like, okay, fine. You know, somebody will come home, you'll call your neighbor. Oh, you just had a baby. How's everything going? They're on cloud nine. They've only been home for two days. Well, a week or two into it, this starts to really set in. And you're like, my brain feels foggy. I feel like I'm not even myself. And it's, you're not imagining this. Like your body needs sleep. And so being able to, to navigate this and understand, okay, 
how long, how often is the baby going to be up? What does that process look like once the baby wakes up? What is the feeding and burping and swaddling and getting the baby back down? How can we be most efficient about that process? And really, really trying to understand that so that you can have those windows of awake time be as short as possible. Yeah. And also just thinking about what we were saying, the lack of sleep within, you know, the honeymoon period over the, the adrenaline of, I just had a baby wears down, Mm -hmm. but then like that one to two weeks out, there is this huge hormonal drop that people are dealing Mm -hmm. with. And that can affect people as well. So I really think those first few weeks are so, uh, can be challenging. I'm not gonna say Mm -hmm. that for everybody, but for most people, I think it's challenges. That's what, again, having that support is just so important. Again, then as we keep going back to having the setup and the conversation and thinking ahead of time, I feel like so much of the time it's just, and this, I, I'm guilty of this. We just talk so much about the birth, but really mm-hmm. planning for the postpartum. All right, one oh, of the, yeah. Cause most yeah. people that I work with are like, oh, I know what birth class I'm taking. I'm taking this and this is my plan. And it's like, that's great. And there is so much value in preparing for birth and all of that. But the reality is your birth is, you know, one or maybe two days. And it's like this postpartum time and people will be like, well, I am planning. I have, I have my nursery all set up. It's like, okay, that's great too. But also, you know, like also we need to really think about what this time looks like and what does support during this time look like. And that's why, you know, reaching out to understand what doula support looks like, where you live and what it might look like for you. For some, I, there's families I've worked with where I only go there one night a week, but that one night a week makes a huge difference for them. And so you could set them up for the whole week, you know, get get food made, put it in the fridge and freezer. I remember being so hungry all the time. One, I was breastfeeding, but two, I just didn't have a lot of food at the ready. We lived in a small one bedroom on the Upper West Side and it was a small fridge and I was just so hungry all the time. Mm -hmm. So the idea of you know, if you're there once a week, you could get snacks made that you can eat one handed. You could Mm -hmm. get dinners made. So for those listening, you don't have to have a budget to have five days a week for help. Somebody coming in once, twice a week and setting you up for the week could also be really valuable, don't you think? Oh, for sure. And, you know, we think about like, oh, okay, they're home. They've been, you know, the baby's five days old. Things are going fine. This, your body, especially if mom has a C-section, but either way, your body is going through so much during that time. Like if you had your appendix out, nobody would be like, okay, go home and now only sleep three hours a night. And then you know, wake up and do all of these things. Like your body needs time to heal and to recover. And so when you're able to have that support in place to be like, okay, now I know what I'm eating. Now Mm -hmm. I, uh, somebody else did the baby laundry, somebody, you know, whatever the, the tasks are, but at the same time, what can you let go? And so everybody, like I live in a, I also live in a very small house. And so when I had my twins, I, every night after the kids were asleep, I would say to my husband, like, can you just vacuum the living room? And my mom or my mother-in-law would be like, you don't need to vacuum your living room. Like, okay. It's not because I'm like this clean freak. It's because that's my thing. Like I need to walk down in the morning. It's not like that anymore. It's just when you have a three-year-old and there's stuff (laughs) everywhere. You know, that was for me, the big thing, what matters for each person is so different. So what can you let go until you're on the other side of this? Yeah. But what's also important to you? And it doesn't matter if somebody else thinks it's not important. Absolutely. Like for me, it did need to be the vacuum to living room, but I also didn't care if my tub was disgusting. You know what I mean? So you kind of have to, what matters yes. to you, because that's also going to help you mentally. No, grounded. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So I want to get back to the list of what I asked my students. Another thing that came up was somebody said they got really anxious that they wouldn't know how to soothe their baby when their baby cried. So can you talk a little bit about what are some ways of understanding the different cries and then how to help the baby? Yes. And so this is something that before it's that difference before you've ever had a baby. And then after you've had a baby where you're like, Oh, okay. Not that you're immune to a baby's cry, but you're like, "Mm, it just doesn't hit me like it used to, you know, like you might be out to dinner and you're like, Oh my gosh, that baby's crying. Like that would make me so anxious if that was my baby. Whereas when it's your baby and you can, there's things you're going to look for. Like it might seem like that baby's crying and I have no idea what's going on. But when you can understand what to look for when the baby's crying, it's kind of like a little detective work. You can understand how to soothe the baby. In most cases, the baby isn't just like a free for all crying. Like 
if the baby go, the baby's need goes unmet for long enough, like then the baby's just kind of wailing. And, but in the beginning, it's like, okay, he's crying and he's arching his back and his belly's hard. Okay. He probably has a stomach ache. Let's hold him like this and help him to pass gas. Or he's crying and he has his fingers in his mouth and he's moving his head side to side. Okay. That's a hunger cue. So he probably needs to be fed. So when you can really understand what are these cues or clues that you're looking for when the baby's crying, it helps you to go from like, I don't know, he's just crying his little head off to like, oh, he's crying and he's doing this, which Mm -hmm. probably means that, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm I'm glad you touched on that. All right, so let's circle to the idea of interviewing a postpartum doula. Because not everyone's going to be the right fit because each person, you know, may have certain things they're looking for. So what are some questions someone that's interviewing a postpartum doula should consider to make sure it is a good fit? Yes. So I think the first step would be you're going to look and, you know, likely most postpartum doulas will have a website or something like that. And you're looking to see, um, you know, does this person likely travel to the area where I live? Does it say like what they charge? Is it even in the ballpark for me? You're reaching out to, to touch base by phone first. So I live here. I'm due this month. Um, how much do you charge? I think I'm looking for two nights a week. The first, the logistics of that. The second stage of like, okay, all's well with that. You're going to meet face to face. And my recommendation is that it happens in your home where the doula will be working. Because if the doula comes and you have a dog and the doula hates dogs or, Mm. you know, whatever the case is, like, this is where we live. This is, you know, and then you can have a situation, you can have a conversation around, okay, where would you be with the baby at night or, you know, kind of like that. But when you're meeting face to face, you're understanding like, is this someone that, you know, I really mesh well with. And that's when we're talking about doing this months in advance, again, as you get closer and you don't, you know, it's like, okay, this is the only person I could find and my baby's already born, but let's, let's assume you're months out here. You want to meet with people and really understand, do we mesh well together as a postpartum doula? I go into people's homes at one of the most sensitive times. It's like, you're you know, if you've given birth, I work with a lot of families who are adopting also, but if you've given birth, you're bleeding, you're sleeping less than you're used to. You're navigating this new relationship with your partner. It's a very intimate, personal relationship. Mm -hmm. And you want to, like I say to people, you know, if, if I'm annoying you right now and you slept well last night, like, it's okay. Uh, You know, you're not for like, everybody's different, but you want to find someone where you're like, okay, I trust what she's saying. I, you know, I feel like this is someone who I would be open to, cause you're going to be talking like, okay, how much are you bleeding now? And they're very personal questions. So mm-hmm. is this someone you would feel comfortable having those conversations with? And you want to be really open with yourself. And when I, as a doula go to someone's house, I'm doing the same thing. Like, is this somewhere I would feel comfortable being? Is this a family that, you know, I feel like we would work well together. And, and that meeting face to face is really important. I really encourage, cause after COVID sometimes it was like, well, now we do that by zoom. It's like, I I really think that it should happen face to face. Okay. And then what about not everyone has, I should, again, now I have a house, but when I lived in the city after having kids, we didn't have a ton of space. How do people navigate that? Do Does the doula sometimes sleep on the couch? Do they need their own room? Like, are they in the baby's room? If the baby has a room, how do, if maybe the baby's sleeping in the parent's room, how does all that, how does the logistics of that work? Well, you'll talk that over, like, it'll kind of, and that's another reason it's helpful to have the doula come and it'll be like, Hey, here's where our room is. So let's say that I came to your house, you're pregnant with your first baby. And you're like, we have a one bedroom apartment. So we would look and say, okay, on the nights I'm not here, the baby would probably sleep in the bassinet in your room on the nights I'm here. How about if we pull the bassinet out into the living room and I'll keep the baby out here. Let's put a sound machine right by your door so that if the baby's crying, you're, um, not hearing as much. And then Mm -hmm. I always say to people, if you hear the baby crying at night, never, ever think I need help. (laughs) Like if I, if something was wrong, like I, you know, I've got it under control here. So don't hear the baby crying and be like, she must need me. Like if I need you, I'll come get you. But that honestly has never happened. Um, it's just like, sometimes it's like, okay, I'm changing his diaper and he needs to eat or something. So we'll put that sound machine by your door and, um, let's say you're going to nurse. So it's like, okay, then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to come wake you up each time that the baby needs to be fed. Every doula is different. 
I don't sleep when I'm at someone's house. Some doulas, I actually didn't know this until all that recently. I was like, most postpartum doulas do sleep. I was like, wait, when did we start sleeping? I have never been sleeping, but some postpartum doulas will sleep. So they would say like, okay, I'm just going to sleep on your couch when the baby's asleep. Um, so you would be able to, to just have those conversations very openly. And then you might try something and be like, oh, that didn't work. Like, could we try putting the bassinet over here or could we try doing it this way? And sometimes, you know, the first couple of nights you might want the baby in your room. I haven't encountered this myself, but I've talked to doulas where like they wanted to keep the baby in there. Then I would come in when the baby needed to be, um, you know, cared for. So you can really just, you want to feel like you can be really open in the questions that you're asking and the concerns that you're having. Um, and just kind of working out those logistics. This is great. And then we ask one final question before I get to kind of some wrap up stuff, but is there, I know for when I was doing my birth doula work, I was trained through Dona and I believe they also have postpartum training. That's who I'm trained for. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's who I'm trained through as well. So that's something that people should look for as well. I'm guessing that they have an actual training or do you feel like this is a job that someone could just mentor with someone and that's how they learn the skills. Do you have any thoughts on that? I do. So I think that like there's sites out there where you can find, you know, you can look up like a registry of doulas. And what I always say, and I refer people to those sites, but I say, this isn't like an RN, like a registered nurse. It's not like, okay, I'm you know, there was this, or even a lactation counselor, like a CLC, I had to sit for an exam. And so I, we know I've had this much training and I've recertified and all of those things. You can call yourself a doula and not be trained at all. Or you could call yourself a doula and you went through like a training that this woman had or something. So I think understand what matters to you. If you're like, no, I want them to have had a certification. Like Dona is a very old organization with, you know, like, does that matter to you? Do you want them to be certified in CPR and first aid? Do you want them to be insured? Um, there's different, I think just understand what the possibilities are. So they could be certified. They don't need, they, you know, or it might be, there's also in situations where this person's a birth doula, but they've started doing postpartum work. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you can understand that it might be like, oh, well, I really like her and that's fine with me that she's never actually gone through the certification. I'm comfortable with her. Or you might be like, no, I'm, I'm really looking for someone who has that certification. So I think understand that the word doula can mean a lot of different things mm-hmm. and un- what matters to you is what you then want to look for. Thank you. Now that really clarifies things. Okay. We're going to take another break. When we come back, what is one final tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer new and expectant parents? We'll be right back. All right. We are back. So do you have anything that's springing to the top of your mind about advice or a tip you'd like to leave our listeners with? For sure. So I think that as you are navigating this life with this new little person who it's going to be tricky. It doesn't matter how much you prepare or how many classes you've taken. There's going to be times in those first few weeks where you're like, oh gosh, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Or, oh, I thought this was going to happen and that happened. You need to be showing yourself grace and showing your partner grace throughout this process. And the other thing is remembering that you and your baby are both learning these things. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll go to a a new parent's house and it's like, oh, breastfeeding isn't, breastfeeding isn't going well. And I feel like I don't even know, you know, I don't even know if he's hungry. And I'll say, this baby is three days old. Three days ago, you didn't even know this baby. And he was living in the dark in fluid. (laughs) So he is learning to breathe air. He's never breastfed before. So you are both finding your groove together. And I think recognizing that, not that if I'm a great parent, I'm going to always know what I'm doing. You know, like my daughter's 17 and I say to her, we're guessing, like (laughs) we're doing our best, but we don't really know what we're doing. You're figuring it out as you go and showing yourself grace to be like, well, that wasn't right. I thought that was going to go differently, you know, and, yeah. and just really being open to it constantly evolving. And just when you think you've got the newborn stage down, you're like, Oh, now he's crawling. And I <laughs> thought I had the place baby proofed. And I turned around and he's holding like, you know, an electric cord. <laughs> so <laughs> Just keep showing yourself grace. Where can people find your work? 
Sure. So thank you. I am most active on Instagram at New Parents Academy, although I'm also on TikTok and YouTube. And I help um, people who are preparing to adopt a newborn as well, which we didn't talk a lot about today, but that can be another road that, you know, it can be tricky. And so I think having adoption specific resources as well. But for those of um, your audience who are preparing to welcome a baby through pregnancy, that I have a free workshop at newparentsacademy.com slash free if you want to link that. I absolutely will. Wow, Valerie, I have really enjoyed this conversation and I can also see how incredibly passionate you are about your work. So this has been so much fun. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening.